Hello and welcome. I'm Stuart Craner, co-founder of Thinkers 50. Every year, Thinkers 50 inducts new management thinkers into its Hall of Fame, which is supported by our partners at the Higher Group. The Hall of Fame recognizes and celebrates thinkers who have made a significant long-term contribution to management thinking and practice. This year's inductees into the Hall of Fame are a stellar group, and it is a pleasure to recognize their contribution. So my guest today is one of those inductees, Sally Helgerson. Sally, welcome and congratulations on being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Thank you, Stuart. It is really an honor. So Sally, For Forbes has described you as the world's premier expert on women's leadership. You're an internationally best-selling author, speaker and leadership coach. So let's start by asking about your first book, which I, I was surprised to see it didn't really fit in. Uh, the first book you, you did was called Wildcatters, a story of Texans, oil and money, which came out in 1981. It sounds really different. Can you tell us a story about that? It was very different. I was down uh, in Texas working for Harper's Magazine, and I was supposed to do a story about a murder trial in which the murderer was in the oil business. And uh, it was a kind of sleazy murder trial. And I decided, I think the oil business is a lot more interesting than this murder trial. So I went back and got to New York and got a contract for a book on which I had absolutely you know, no expertise at all. And at, in retrospect, you know, because I started about seven or eight years later writing about women leaders, it always seemed like an outlier. But now from the perspective of almost 40 years, that book looks very much a part of my larger work because it's really focused on leadership, what's, what makes for excellence in leadership. And um, even though there were no women in it, it gave me a grounding in leadership, but also in business. So what, what happened in those seven or eight years to turn you, uh, you turn your direction away from tax and oil men to uh, women in leadership? Well, in the seven and, or eight years, as a result of my writing that book, I began to get lots of invitations to write uh, speeches for senior executives, at first in the oil industry, but then more broadly in telecom and technology. So I was occupied doing that and really enjoying it. You essentially get to be a journalist uh, for a company. And of course, it was much more well paid than uh, being a freelance journalist. But uh, it, as I was working with some really terrific organizations, and this is in the 80s, in the 1980s, what was obvious to me was that they had no clue as to what women could be contributing. It was very obvious, uh, not just myself, but a lot of the women I worked with. So I began to gather material and gather my thoughts for trying to write a book about what women at their best had to contribute as leaders. And that came together in the female advantage, Women's Ways of Leadership, which was published in 1990, and I'm proud to say is still in print. And it was the first book that looked at what women had to contribute as leaders, rather than how they needed to change and adapt. There was writing about that in the 1980s, but it was primarily focused on on, you know, you're in the army now, if it moves, salute it, get with the program, you're not gonna change anything, adapt. You know, it was the bow tie era and there's a reason we talk of it that way. It was about women trying to leave anything they had in particular, any insights that they'd learned from their roles as wives, as mothers, as community members, um, leaving that at home. And, uh, and trying to adapt to a, a culture that had been almost entirely dominated by men. So that book, I think, because it was the first, it really resonated. And companies began asking me in to talk to their women. And I thought, well, I'd rather write my own speeches than write speeches for uh, senior executives. So I kind of went with it. And uh, uh, 35 years later, almost, here we are. Yeah, it's amazing, really. 1990, which isn't isn't that long ago in the the broad sweep of things, that um, women in leadership was so neglected. And you think about um, women who kind of even contributing to the world of management thinking and ideas. You go back to 
Uh, Mary Parker Follett, who's somebody at uh, the Fingers 50 who's worked with, with Saluted, and I know is one of your heroes. Yeah. She, she was writing in the 1920s and 30s. But apart from her and Rosabeth Moss Cantor in the, in the 1980s with her men and women of the corporation, there's, just, there's, there's nothing, re nothing really from women or about women, women's leadership. Yes, and Rosabeth was really not necessarily writing about what women had to contribute. Mary Parker Follett stands, you know, she's up there with Peter Drucker, in my view, as someone obviously not as famous, but someone who really shaped our understanding of leadership, and it has become ever more apparent uh, as the years have passed. So, yeah, there wasn't much, and there certainly wasn't a focus on what women's strengths were. And that's what I set out to emphasize. My, my primary goal was to talk to organizations. That's what I intended as my audience. Hey, here's an opportunity you're missing. Women have a lot to contribute. Here are some specifics. But it didn't turn out to land that way. It turned out to really influence women to have a greater understanding of what they could contribute. The most common response I got, of course, back then we were in the letters uh, to, sent via the publisher era. The most common response I got was, you've helped me understand I have a leadership style. I thought it was just how I did things. So that was very affirming to me. And really since that first book, I've had a pretty consistent mission, which is twofold. Uh, number one, to help women leaders and aspiring women leaders all around the world to recognize, articulate, and act on their greatest strengths, and also to help organizations develop more inclusive cultures in which women and those who stand outside the historic leadership mainstream can really thrive. So that's been pretty much the life's work of the last 35 years. Yeah, it's easy to underestimate how uh, you were a fa fairly lonely voice. I mean, that's what I was trying to say before with Mary Parker Follett, Rosabeth Moss Cantor. But the, there weren't many people at all picking up the, the, these issues. I mean, one one person who picked, picked the uh, issues of women's leadership and 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 inclusion was uh, Tom Peters, actually, and and he's been a, he's been a big champion of, uh, of of that issue over that period, but you were in a very isolated voice. Did, did you feel that? Oh, I felt it. Tom was instrumental in the success of the female advantage in many ways and has been an extraordinary supporter and colleague and friend for almost, you know, 33 years now. Uh, so that has been a great advantage. And I think that especially then having a man say, listen up, this is important. This is what we all need to understand. I think that was really essential, but it was a lonely voice. Uh, it was, I cannot tell you over the decades how many people until very recently said, you know, Sally, you've got to get out of women's leadership. You know, you'll never make any money. You'll never have any impact. Uh, why don't you move on and, you know, jump on whatever is is uh, is out there. And I knew it was right. I knew it was an important topic and that its time would come, that I think it would take quite as long as it did. I, I'm not sure. But uh, I'm very glad I persisted because it was both uh, a passion. I felt that I had a lot to contribute. And I did have supporters along the way, Tom and later later Marshall, and certainly many, many, um, many women in the field, names forgotten, or I, sh I shan't say forgotten, but not as recognized now, like Rayona Sharpneck, who really, really gave me a lot of support. Yeah, is it a number of women I encountered in the academic world who'd been told that their work on inclusion in the 1980s and 90s was kind of not career ending, but it was career limiting. And they were encouraged to move elsewhere and do other research. You know, it what what was interesting is that back then, talking about women's leadership, talking in particular about inclusion as a goal for organizations, that was all siloed as sort of soft skills. 
And when I would talk about it, often I'd get an objection, you know, what you're talking about. I would talk about what women's strengths were, you know, uh, ability to build strong, deep, close relationships. Well, that's a soft skill. That's not a leadership skill. What has been fascinating to me, and I know that I have a lot of colleagues who are somewhat pessimistic and they say, oh, I can't believe it's taken this long. And here we are in 2022 and we still haven't made much progress. I'm sorry, I've been there for 40 years. We've made a lot of progress. And one of the primary ways we've made progress, and I think women are under accredited for this, is that um, we've really watched how excellence in leadership has been redefined. Obviously, Tom was instrumental in that, but excellence in leadership is now defined in a way that is that comprehends many of the um, characteristics I identified as particularly strong for women. So that's been an interesting evolution to watch. It hasn't always been a smooth road, but that that idea of, you know, the I mean, it's hard to imagine 30 years ago, Fortune magazine used to have a yearly um, edition, a yearly, yeah, yearly edition uh, called America's Toughest Boss. Uh, or the world's toughest boss. And it would be a profile of someone who was just, by today's standards, extremely toxic to work for. But, you know, he gets results, he gets things done. Of course, five years later, he flamed out. But uh, it, it was interesting the way in which we bought into a certain leadership myth about, um, you know, toughness and, and heroism. Listen, Stuart, this is also we defined how excellence is perceived in terms of military leadership as well. So I think that's been significant. Yeah, that's interesting in itself, isn't it? Yeah. And, and well, these issues are global as well. I know you're, 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 you're American and you tend to see the iconic business leaders of the last century have largely been American, but the issues you talk about are, are truly global. Well, certainly, and uh, and and we see, you know, other India, for example, being so dominant. I was astonished the other day. I think it was the Economist published a list of the twenty top leaders of Microsoft and uh, Google, et cetera, uh, in in Silicon Valley, and I think sixteen of them uh, were either Indian by background or Indian by nationality. So yeah, we're in a global world. And I think that that on one hand makes it easier to redefine excellence in leadership because we draw from a broader base. Uh, sometimes it makes it harder because we have uh, cultural issues that, that sometimes stand in the way or are a bit different um, uh, in different parts of the world. And, you, and you've worked with the United Nations, haven't you? What, what, what did you do with them? Well, that was interesting. Uh, the work I did with the United Nations, uh, the book I published after The Female Advantage was called uh, The Web of Inclusion, A New Architecture for Building Great Organizations. And it was the first book uh, that I knew of back in the Nexus search days, we could, we could confirm this, uh, where Lexus or Nexus uh, that we could, uh, it was the first use of the word or the term inclusion in reference to organizations and, and business. So I was looking at what, what are the characteristics of an inclusive uh, organization, what gets in the way. And the work had a lot of influence on a woman, Sharon Kapling Alakisha, who at that time was the head of uh, UN volunteer. She'd previously been head of strategy for uh, the whole UNDP, and she made her book compulsory reading for the entire for both of those organizations. And she did a project whereby she designed the architecture, using that word, of ten country offices around the world, so that they could be structured in a way where they could listen to nonprofits and to the civil, what today we would call civil society. So they could hear that rather than just interacting with the political leaders. And then I was hired to go and do an evaluation in four of those countries, uh, in Egypt, in Zimbabwe, in Pakistan, and in Costa Rica, to look at how that 
uh, worked out. So it was a, a, an extraordinary opportunity to see the cultural diversity and the cultural impediments in terms of building an inclusive uh, organization or structure at a countrywide as well as organization-wide basis. And then they're not nations where, which would automatically come to mind if you thought about uh, inclusivity necessarily. But no. uh, the, I, what I like about the, the, the book, we're talking about the, the web of inclusion and a new architecture for, for building great organizations. It came out in 1995 but even, even the title feels very uh, contemporary. I think the Wall Street Journal said it was one of the best books on leadership, leadership of all times. And as you say, brought the language of inclusion in, in, into business. Yeah, it does feel um, present. You know, one thing that was interesting is when I wrote that book, there was no equation or no thought of equating diversity and inclusion. And over the last um, maybe two decades, maybe a little less, we've come to sort of put those two words together. We speak of DNI, now we speak of DEI, but diversity and inclusion have gone together. And I think sometimes it's baffling to people because they say, you know, our goal is diversity. No, diversity is the nature of the global talent pool. Your goal is to create an inclusive culture because that is the sole means by which a highly diverse talent force can be managed at the highest level. So they go together, but they go together, I think, in a different way than is commonly understood. I mean, you're very, and the message comes through your work. You're very positive and, and, and optimistic. But where, where you must have encountered a lot of low times. You must have, you must, there must have been lots of times when you thought we're make, we're not making any headway at all. Yes. Where, can, you, can you tell share some, when when those times were? I mean, the, the 1990s, as, as you said, there, there's all talk of re-engineering and uh, Jack Welsh, and it was kind of a very hard macho uh, corporate environment. It was a very hard, I mean, it was the, the Jack Welch era is how I think of it, with all the, those ideas about, you know, every year we need to get rid of 10% of our workforce, they're just dead, dead wood, never thinking maybe our leadership and management systems are one of the reasons they're unperforming. No, they're just, you know, get them out of here. So it was a tough era in that, but there was this very rich undercurrent of of interest in building organizations that were better able to take advantage of a broader spectrum of talent. It was the war for talent era, for example. So a lot of organizations were interested in more inclusive practices because they were out there working in the talent space. Um, but I think that the thing that is different now is that the war for talent and that need to engage and inspire people at every level was really seen as, as cyclical, as dependent upon the nature of the economy at the moment, as opposed to what Peter Drucker understood, a fundamental shift that was embedded both in the nature of the technology, which is um, by virtue of its architecture, empowering, not exclusively empowering, as we're coming to see, but empowering, and also by a shift in human beings who felt that they wanted their voices to be heard in an, to an extent that was not really true in the, in the post-war era, which I think it was what uh, the Welsh ideology was pretty much at the end of. So that's, um, that, that undercurrent was there and it was in a lot of work like D. Hawk, if you remember D. Hawk, he was the um, the CEO of Visa and he did a lot of work about creating networks and you know in a in a more human-centered way. So there was a lot going on. For me, the periods that were more challenging were the periods in the run-up to the recession and certainly right afterwards. Because again, there was still this idea that all this diversity, all this inclusion work, this is fine for a time of growth, but if we need to retrench, we can drop that because it's not really needed. And I remember, in, in fact, at one point I, I was speaking at um, four War for Talent conferences. I think this was around the time actually of the 
post dot com bust, and they were all canceled. <laughs> and when I called, I said, what, "What's the theme here?" And uh, one of the guys said, "Well, you know, the war for talent is so over. I mean, you know, it's a bad economy now. People take whatever work they can get." Well, we're seeing now that that's not true. So uh, it's it's been an interesting thing to watch that shift the recognition that this is a fundamental shift, not a cyclical shift, dependent upon whether the economy is hot or not. Yeah, the war for talent is over and talent won, I think. Yes. Um, yes. What's interesting about your work, Sally, is that the gaps between the books it suggest you have, you have quite a lot of thinking time. So you had the, the female advantage in 1990, then the, the web of inclusion in 1995, and then it took until 2010 until the female vision uh, came out women's real power at work and that that explores how women's strategic insights can strengthen their their careers uh, that's true except i did write two books in that period of time i wrote a book called everyday revolutionaries working <laughs> women it's fine well, <laughs> well, we'll edit that bit, bit, bit out <laughs> uh working women in the transformation of life and uh the other one was called Thriving in 24-7, but the timing was awkward on both of them and they never, neither of them really fulfilled their potential. I think they're relevant now, but yeah, I usually spend five years between a book and part of it is that I do a lot of speaking and uh, so that keep, used to keep me on the road. Now it, now it keeps me here in my home office. Yeah, how do you describe what you do? Uh, it's a combination of uh, writing and speaking. I do some coaching, uh, certainly, but uh, the writing and the speaking feed one another. And the ideas for books really come by participating at large conferences or small conferences, by moderating panels and listening to people and hearing how they're concerns change over time and keeping careful notes. My journalistic and speech writing background really comes into um, comes into use by doing that. So I'm able to go back and look over those and say, okay, yes, I really see a strong theme emerging here. And, uh, and that keeps me, um, that keeps me pretty active in in thinking, uh, in trying to discern what would be helpful to people now and what will be helpful to people going forward. Have you always worked as a coach? Or is that, that a more recent incarnation? That's more recent incarnation to work as a coach formally. Um, since I have been doing, especially women's leadership, but also inclusive leadership programs around the world for the last 30 some odd years, I've done a lot of informal coaching, both I, I like the sort of fishbowl coaching model that the, the great Charlie and Edie Seashore kind of put into play in our early days of, of uh, leadership and organizational development, uh, where you do coach people live and people learn from that as a model. So I always incorporated that into my programs. And then people would follow up and say, oh, can you give me a little more coaching? Can we, can we extend that a little bit? So that's when I realized that what I had been doing all along was really was was coaching to some degree. So so I have taken on private clients, not a lot because the writing and the, the speaking keep me pretty busy. And you wrote a book with Marshall Goldsmith, who's one of the most famous uh, or perhaps the most famous uh, executive coach in the world. And you wrote, wrote a book, the 2018 book, How Women, Women Rise. Tell, tell us about your relationship with Marshall. How did that come about? And how, how did the book come about? Well, Marshall and I, uh, they're both good stories. Marshall and I met in 1995, right after the Web of Inclusion came out. And we were both speaking at a Peter Drucker Foundation conference that was out in, um, in Southern California. And it was about three hours from Marshall's house. So, of course, Marshall had a big party. And I, I didn't know him at all. He was... At, I was a keynoter and Marshall was doing a breakout. <laughs> Times change. And uh, so he invited a bunch of us to uh, to this big party at his house. We went up there and we really hit it off. And then I got a call from Marshall about six months later and he was starting a group 
called the Learning Network, which was going to be comprised of colleagues who worked alone in the field of leadership. So the idea was everybody else had colleagues. We didn't have colleagues. It was pretty lonely. We didn't have people to talk about what we did with necessarily. Uh, so we were going to uh, create a network of people who did this. And this group, the Learning Network, is now in its 26th year. We have continued to meet once a year since. Marshall and I became quite close. And it was very interesting because around about 2015, I've been writing about, as I've been talking about here, women's strengths and what they had to contribute for many decades and expanding that work and growing that work, the female vision, women's visionary capacity. That's an expansion of work on women's strengths. But I knew that I needed to address some of the internal barriers that continued to hold women back. So when I read Marshall's great book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, which is about the habits and um, behaviors most likely to hold back successful people as they move into leadership, I thought it was a great model to use, particularly because of Marshall's brilliant insight, which was that the same habits and behaviors that can serve us well early in our careers can be the very ones that trip us up when we move into leadership. And yet we remain loyal to them because we recognize that they have gotten us here where we are. Uh, so uh, that really resonated with me. But uh, many of the behaviors, or some of the behaviors, I should say, in the book uh, that Marshall talked about, in my experience, were not a big problem for most women. You know, learn to apologize. <laughs> that one made me laugh because I travel all, all, all over the world or was then and women are constantly apologizing often for things they never did. Uh, and, you know, don't always talk about how great you are. And there were many habits that I saw tripping women up on their path to leadership that were not in the book. So I suggested to Marshall that we collaborate on a book that looked specifically at uh, what the internal barriers were, what was most likely to hold women back on their leadership uh, journey, whatever lay within their control. That's why I emphasize um, uh, internal barriers. I'm a big fan of the old Stephen Covey idea of the difference between your circle of concern and your circle of control. Uh, so this was what lay within your circle of control. And Marshall loved the idea. I mean, he loved the idea. He said he'd been getting some feedback that the book seemed a bit male centric and not of not to include some of what was problematic for women. So we decided to collaborate on it and uh, how women rise was the result. And it's been, you know, more successful than I, I could ever have dreamed it would be and more resonant around the world than I could have dreamed. We've sold in 22 languages. Behind me, if you can see it, is my Mongolian edition. I never thought I'd sell a book in Mongolian. So it's been, it's really been a phenomenon. And uh, great working with Marshall, I have to tell you. You know, it was a, like an extended coaching session. And uh, we spent a lot of time, of course, also laughing and, uh, and going out to some pretty enjoyable dinners. But I learned so much from him. And we went, we, we did the India launch together and uh, traveled around India. And that's when I saw the real Iron Man uh, component of Marshall Goldsmith at work. You know, that thing of getting off a 16 hour flight to Mumbai and walking right on stage. It's quite amazing. Yeah. What's interesting is the, the, the global audience, as you say, the, the Mongolian edition, which suggests this, the issues you're talking about have, are of their time now. Do you feel that? I do feel that. And I also feel that they they help me understand how much we have in common, how similar the barriers women face are. When I did the launch myself in Japan, uh, I did a couple of big programs and the feedback I got was pretty consistent. Oh, we thought these were only problems that Japanese women had. We didn't know women in UK or Europe or America had these had these issues too. We thought this was just Japanese. And I've heard this over and over. Oh, we thought this was Turkish women. We thought this was Brazilian. 
women, et cetera. So uh, it's been, it's affirmed to me how much we fundamentally have in common. And uh, I'm not just talking about women, but but we as human beings. So that's been, um, that's been pretty inspiring. And uh, it's one of the reasons I remain optimistic. And, and, your, and your next book coming out in 2023 is, is Rising Together. So how, how does that relate? Where, where, where are you taking the, the ideas for the, for the new book? Rising Together really looks at what are the barriers to men and very specific terms uh, to men and women and, and a diverse range of people rising together, that is being really serving one another in their careers and in building capacity in their organizations. What gets in the way of that? And what very, very specific, hands-on, how-to, tactical, um, uh, what are some ways we can address that? So it's uh, like How Women Rise, it's very hands-on, it's very coaching-based. I got the idea, I was... um, you know, I do a lot of conferences and of in-person conferences, of course, in that uh, first two years after How Women Rise came out. And I was invited uh, at the end, very end of 1990, I'm sorry, <laughs> 2019, to speak at the Construction Super Conference in Las Vegas. And it was a women's leadership program. So I had in mind a picture that I was gonna, it was a breakout, it's massive conference. I took out the whole Wynn Hotel. So I had the idea in mind that I would walk into this room and there would be about a hundred women there who were in the construction uh, industry and who felt frustrated and unseen and unappreciative and unsure of what they could do to really make their mark. And I walked into the room and there were over 300 people there and about 65% of them were men. I could not have been more astonished. And I said to the group, because I wasn't quite sure how to calibrate this. I mean, what I prepared was based on the fact that I thought it was gonna be a female audience. So I said to the group, you know, what brought you here? Why did you sign up for this sort of an outlier at a construction super conference? And one of the gentlemen stood up and he was, he owned a big construction firm. And he said, look, we hope you're not gonna waste our time telling us why we need to get better at uh, promoting, uh, at at engaging and promoting women leaders and also other diverse people. We get it, we understand, we know the demographics, we've seen the writing on the wall, but we have no understanding of how to do it. Can you help us? And that's when the idea for Rising Together was born right there at that construction super conference, because I thought, yes, I, I, I can help you out here. I can identify what's getting in the way, what unconscious, I don't, I don't actually like to use the word unconscious, but what, what behaviors uh, might be sending a signal that you're not aware of to women or to, um, you know, black people, to Latinos, whatever, uh, to people, you know, gay people. What, what might be the behaviors that are discouraging them or making them feel not included? I felt like I had a good understanding of that since I've been working with inclusion for, you know, 28 years. And, uh, and then how can you do things differently, but very tactically, not, you know, big grand. There's so much, so many grand statements about our commitment is to, you know, I've been a speechwriter. I wrote some of those statements. I know that they go skin deep. Uh, a lot of grand statements, a lot of abstract models, et cetera. A lot of HR policies, important. I'm not saying that they're not, but in terms of helping people understand the signals that their behavior sends and how to get comfortable engaging people that they may not have had that much of a history of engaging. That's what I see as the real work of the next decade. Yeah, the notion of serving one another is a, a sea change in attitude from the from practice in the in the 1990s, say, or, or, or earlier. Yeah, exactly. And 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 from what you said, I mean, there is an international appetite for that sea change. 
There is. And I think, you know, it's driven by the change in the nature of the technology. Uh, I think it's driven by the fact that you can't get a, at the leadership level, you can't get away with the kind of stuff you could get away with back in the 1990s because everybody will be, you'll be on camera and people will be posting and it's, it's not going to, basically, it's not going to work. But most importantly, I think it really has to do with what I spoke about earlier is this shift in how excellence in leadership has become defined over the last 30 plus years. You have military units around the world. I'm not just talking about the US military, but I'm talking about NATO as well, where you have um, an emphasis on empathy and developing that capacity in soldiers. We see mission cha a, a change in the nature of missions. And I think that that the, the war we're looking at now is such a wonderful example of, of trying to do top down, admittedly fairly you know, problematically, and a real grassroots approach to how uh, military units are led. Uh, so I, I, I think this is a worldwide phenomenon that it affects not just business and, and management, it affects sports, it affects the military, it affects uh, how we lead our families and in our communities. Of course, there's a lot of pushback. <laughs> I'm not saying that there's not some noisy pushback, but uh, but this is the the movement of the future. And I don't see, it'll always go forward a little bit, come back a little bit, forward a little bit, back a little bit. Any of us who've been around a while know that, but I see this as the direction of the future. Yeah, military-wise, one of your hero heroes is uh, Colonel Diane Ryan, isn't it? Diane, yes, she she's really extraordinary. I I wrote about her in my Substack newsletter uh, last week. But there, you know, there are many. General Tom Colditz, who was her boss at uh, West Point, really extraordinary uh, leader, and uh, you know, very brave leaders. Mark Milley, we've seen uh, you, your own um, Ben. Who's your head of? Your Ministry of Defense, he's fantastic and mm -hmm. seems to have a, you know, this kind of orientation as well. So you see it, you see it across the board. Um, certainly you see it in, in the Scandinavian militaries, uh, which are now joined into NATO and I think will have a significant impact. Ben Wallace, I think. Ben Wallace, that's it. I always confuse him with Ben Hodges, who's an American general. Ben Wallace, that's it. I mean, he talk, you know, I don't like to use the language of he gets it because that implies other people don't get it. But but he is really an extraordinary leader in, in, in my view and exemplifies this sort of forward push into a more inclusive uh, leadership model in um, an understanding of that in the military, in military science. You talked about noisy pushback. I suppose, I suppose so, social media uh, provides an, an exaggerated form of no, noisy, noisy pushback for, for many of these issues. I think it does, but it's also, the noisy pushback is of limited interest. So once you get some of your filters in place, the noisy pushback it's kind of repeating the same thing over and over. It's even when it, it, it even when it's not bots, it's kind of bot like because it's repetitive and not particularly imaginative or engaging. So the people who seem to get followerships, attract followerships of thought leaders, of of people who who might have a, a place in an organization like Thinkers 50, uh, have a much more creative approach and are are sharing ideas in evolution as they evolve. So I think social media also has 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 an enormous contribution to make in this evolution of how we understand excellence in leadership. What, what about the role of the pandemic? Has that accelerated the process of inclusivity? You, you know, you would, you would hope it has. What one would hope, uh, but it, more important than hoping, I think there there's signals in both directions. Number one, the pandemic has definitely increased divisiveness. You know, as we've watched 
uh, coming into the workplace, divisiveness over issues such as masking, vaccination, et cetera, have, uh, have, have dribbled into the workplace. And we see many high profile examples of that. So that's divisive and division is not, uh, you know, by definition, inclusive. We've also seen a growth in isolation because we're not with each other. So I think those those two factors have pushed back, have, have mitigated against the, the the positive trends. On the other hand, I'm I'm often struck by the whatever it is, but whatever we want to call it, the great resignation, um, the the fact that people are less seem less willing to stay in jobs where they feel profoundly uh, disrespected and uh, underpaid. I think that 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 is the kind of empowerment that we've been talking about in this uh, thought leadership space for for a number of decades, that that's what the actual on the ground grassroots empowerment looks like. People saying, you know, I'm not sure that this is sustainable for me. Uh, I know that I'm not using my best talents. I know I'm not being appreciated. I know I'm not breaking through. So I I want to pull back for a while. So I've had this conversation with my uh, wonderful colleague, Hubert Jolie, who was CEO of Best Buy. And, you know, as, as I'm sure you know, anybody who's read his magnificent book, The Heart of Business, um, really led in a different way and tried to listen to people and create a company that was great out of that. So I think Uber's model is the model going forward, the post-pandemic model. Many of us have contributed bits of that. And um, so I think it's both like many big, uh, startling, unexpected changes, social changes, that it's had both positive and negative impact. And uh, we have to deal with the negative openly, confronting it, but also find ways to accentuate what the gifts that have come to us um, because of the pandemic. Uh, Hubert Jolie won the uh, Leadership Award at the Thinkers 50 2020-2021, deservedly as well. Uh, you, you also mentioned Tom Peters and people like Dee Hock at Visa. Who do you read now? Who, who who makes you think and inspires you at the moment? Well, you know, I've been rereading uh, Drucker, and I've been rereading my own one of my heroes, Marshall's heroes, the woman to whom we dedicated How Women Rise, Frances Hesselbein, who was head of the Drucker Foundation, brought Marshall and I together in that way, uh, and who led a series of nonprofits. She, she, until about two years ago, she was still teaching, doing programs, uh, doing leadership in military academies. She is I coming up this November on either age 108 or 109. Um, so she's pulling back a little bit, but uh, I've been rereading her work, which is really very important in terms of thinking about how um, uh, demonstrating the the behaviors that enable us to exemplify uh, inclu inclus inclusivity. Uh, I think she was a real pioneer in that in that era. I wrote about her in the Female Advantage: Women's Ways of Leadership. Did that interview almost thirty five years ago. But her work and her thinking still very relevant. And then I've been reading a lot about uh, leadership, both political and military in World War II, because I think we're at that kind of era where we're beginning to appreciate bravery and understand just how much courageous leaders can contribute. Also read a lot of Amy Edmonds, Edmondson, I think her work is spectacular, uh, really resonate, resonates with me. So uh, there's plenty out there. Yeah, I wonder, what's, the, what's, the, what's your opinion on business schools and their contribution over the last 30 years? Because things like courage and uh, fearlessness, 
uh, and inclusivity haven't actually been top of their agenda for, for much of this time. You know, I think that business schools to some extent have been driven by the interests of the high net worth donors who really shape a lot of the curricula and agenda. And many of them, not all, but many of them have been focused on, you know, bottom line financials which is not a very transformative approach. You're measuring what's worked in the past. You're not, you're not imagining what could work in the future. So I think that's been an issue uh, in some business schools. I think that leadership also has been an issue. It's been fascinating uh, to look at, at some of the changes in a number of schools. Harvard, uh, when they began to change their leadership model, brought in Natan, um, to head uh, Harvard Business School. So it's not my area of expertise. I didn't go to business school. Uh, I've certainly done a lot of executive leadership programs in business schools, but um, the internal machinations and workings, I'm pretty, pretty removed from. I'm very fortunate that I don't have to go through peer review with my, with my work, that I'm an independent um, thinker, author, and uh, and um, you know, I'm an independent contributor. Yeah, tru truly independent. Sally, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, a real joy uh, talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. I would encourage anybody watching to seek out any of uh, Sally Sally's books, uh, How Women Rise, uh, most recently, and Rising Together, the new book coming out in 2023. Sally, congratulations on being inducted into the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame and best of luck with your future work. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. It's just, it's really an honor.